Hi, I'm Chris Wagner. I'm the current chair of the Mobile Interpretation Program, or as we like to call it, the Mint Van Program. I'm going to uh, give you a little history first, and then we're going to take her out to one of our spots that we like to set up and show you exactly kind of what we do and how we work with the visitors. So a little bit of history, in 2012, state parks offered the use of an electric vehicle that they were no longer using, and a bunch of docents led by Pat Sinclair jumped on that idea and with the help of Melissa actually got the van vehicle here, kind of loaded it up with a set of eclectic items, artifacts, some pelts, some books, and some posters, and drove it out to Bird Island and wanted to interact with visitors and let them kind of experience these kinds of things. Uh, it coincided with the fact that in 2012, the Bird Island ADA Trail had just opened. So now there were a lot more visitors coming down there, and there really wasn't any interpretation materials there. So through 2012, it kind of grew, more docents got excited about the program, and that went through 2013, through the winter, it became clear this was a great program, but the vehicle really wasn't optimal. It was a little hard to load and unload, uh, the bins were getting heavier, and we had more and more artifacts that we wanted to take out there. So in the fall, we worked with PLF, and at that time, Anna Patterson was the grants writer, and she wrote a grant with the Community Foundation of Monterey, and they paid for about half of it, and PLF paid for a half, and we acquired this wonderful electric vehicle that you see here. It's a, a vehicle that you might see in Monterey. It's used, lots of cities use it for maintenance. We put this beautiful box on the back of it. I'll show you the inside in a little bit. And that's how we transport to and from Bird Island or wherever else on the reserve that we want to go. So I'm standing in the garage right now. PLF, of course, owns and maintains the mint van, but we park it here in the garage. Since there's not too many people around, let me give you a little behind the scenes tour real quick. So, of course we park it here, but if you look over here, you'll realize this is really how we curate and everything is in bins. For example, here's our easy access program and how they've assembled it and their wagons, the posters that we use for various events, and when we did the rest South Shore restoration, we had a poster for that. And over here, are all the maps, for example, that they sell at the kiosk, all of our uh, brochures, like birds and plants, as well as all the international multilingual uh, sheets of paper that we hand out for various people. And on the other side of the garage is things where state parks uses for their programs like summer adventure and all that. So pretty much here is all interpretation. It's all kind of jammed into this one spot, but we all get along reasonably well. So the mint van is all about interpretation. So let's head out and set up and show you how we actually do this. Before we go, we always make sure that everybody is packed in correctly so we don't bounce around too much. I'm just going to give you a little peek here about what goes on. I hope you, I gave you the impression that we now have lots of artifacts. So we have our, some of our birds. I'll show you those. And all these bins are carefully curated. I think everything looks great. Our birds look like they're happy and they're definitely ready to get out to the reserve. So follow me. Okay, hi, we're back. We're out here at Piney Woods. We usually head out to Bird Island where we have a, a dedicated parking spot. But today, just to keep us away from all everyone else, we can get this film going. We've moved to Piney Woods. This actually is a place we set up uh, when we do school walks. So we don't do every school walk, but we'll sometimes come out here, set up. And when the kids come back from their walk and they're doing lunch, we'll bring a group up at a time and, and we'll have this all laid out for them. And that's a great way for them to kind of end their uh, field trip here. So what we do as a mint fan, one of the fun things is you noticed all those bins full of artifacts. And one of the fun things about uh, doing a mint fan shift is that you basically get to choose what you want to put out. And we have way more things than you can put out on 
one table or even two tables. There are, of course, lots and lots of favorites and almost everybody puts out. Of course, we have the otter pelt here. Everybody wants to touch and feed the otter pelt. We have harbor seal, our mountain lion, which has uh, been in the news quite a bit, has always uh, enthralls people. And of course, one of my favorites is the sperm whale tooth. And this, people are pretty mind boggled about the size and the weight of this single tooth of a sperm whale. But a lot of times there's just stories that you can sort of connect. And one example that actually comes up fairly frequently is people come and say, hey, do otters and harbor seals compete for food? Which I think is a pretty good question. And so what we can do is say, well, this is the otter. Here's our harbor seal, but let's look at their teeth. And if you look at the teeth, you'll realize that, well, the otter's teeth actually look very much like human teeth, canines. They need to chew like abalone, whereas harbor seals are like razor teeth and they rip and tear fish. So the answer becomes really quite obvious. No, they don't compete at all. They're just in the same space, but they actually don't use the same food at all an example of a story. The other thing that's great is, for example, we're just starting cormorant breeding season. People come down the steps from Bird Island and they say, what is that black bird? And we can go, well, that's a cormorant, but did you notice its beautiful iridescent blue throat? That's a breeding color that males and females get. So again, it kind of starts a conversation. Uh, most people didn't even notice the throat. They don't really know much about the bird. We get to talk about that a little bit. And then, of course, also now we're getting close to harbor seal pupping. It's a time we really want to inform people about when they go up to China Cove, what they should be watching for, they should be quiet. And again, we have a, some harbor seal pelts and a lot more information kind of about that. Uh, normally, we would have a lot more out here. I just wanted to give you kind of an example. Uh, one thing you might have noticed is we have a small donation box here, and we have a little clicker, and we always record the visitors that come to our table that we talk to. Uh, last year, I should say 2019, uh, people donated usually with dollar bills, uh, about $1,800 that all went to PLF, of course. And we served about 18,000 visitors, came to our tables, and we exchanged ideas and talked to them. So that's just really fun and it's a really successful program. Now this program is all about touching, so when kids come up here, we hand them a sperm whale tooth and ask them, please don't drop it, or let them play with a skull. Well, all that touching means that our collection slowly degrades. We either need to clean it, we need to restore it, or we need to acquire new specimens. And PLF, once again, uh, gives us some budget every year to kind of do that. In 2019, or 2020, early 2020, we got a lot of our birds cleaned because they really get uh, loved, overloved. But really what I'm excited about is we had a pelican and we had the taxidermist take a pelican wing and kind of mount it for us. And although everyone who comes through here, especially if they're from California, has seen a pelican, they're just in awe of this wingspan and the feather patterns. And on a windy day, especially at Bird Island, you can just hold this out and feel the lift that the birds have. And it's just really thrilling. Uh, for everybody. So uh, thank you PLF. We have some other specimens we're hoping to get in 2021, maybe a peregrine falcon we might have be able to get hold of. And each one of these we kind of move through the collection and start building stories about. This is our long-tailed weasel. Now you can, they are actually relatively common in the reserve, but you almost never see them. I've seen two in about two years. They sometimes just scurry across the roadway if you're really, really lucky. But the story here is sort of fun because we have this weasel and everybody kind of looks at it and said, well, yeah, that's a weasel. And then I ask, well, what else on this table would this be most related to? And people look around and some people say mountain lion, but, which isn't really a great answer, but it's okay. It's, it, at least they got land to land. But it turns out that our otters that everybody loves are actually also a member of the weasel family. So that lets me say things like, well, otters, are really small sea mammals, but they're really, really big weasels. And yeah, they're cute, but they have really sharp teeth and can be pretty nasty as well. So that's kind of a fun story. People, people love this little weasel, and then they go off looking for it, which is really hard to see. I mentioned earlier that docents get to come up with their own stories and artifacts. I'm just going to show you. Here's our invertebrate bin. Um, one thing that's absolutely amazing is everything is labeled. Everything has a bin, and that way 
those things don't really have to worry about it. They just have to remember to put it back in the right bin. Here, for example, is a shark jaw. Uh, this really thrills, read this guy up, thrills the kids, just showing them shark teeth. It's just absolutely mind boggling. And they're sharp after thousands of touches of people using them. Uh, some people, of course, you know, abalone, uh, you know, just everyone in Monterey Bay knows what these things look like, but other people are just in awe and of, of a big shell like that. And of course, we have lots of things for tide pools. So every once in a while, we've set up out at the tide pool. So we have some sea urchins and people can see them. The important thing is everything here is real. And so we let people look and study, for example, a sea urchin, look at its geometric pattern, understand where the spines come from. And that's one of the real important things about mint. These aren't resin models, these are the real thing, but of course they do kind of break over time and we just need to acquire some new ones. Uh, lots of other things in here, sand dollars, skulls, uh, barnacles, pretty much anything people, someone would want if they want to kind of just put a story together. For example, these come out a lot when we do Underwater Parks Day, and we, along with lots of other folks who are down at Whalers Cove, will bring these out and really have a whole table about the underwater and the tide pools of Prairie Lovers. Okay, so let's just pretend we've been out here two hours. That's our normal shift. Some of us do maybe even three hours, and it's time to pack up. Uh, you might go like, oh my God, how are we gonna figure out how to pack all this stuff in there? Well, fortunately, one of our docents has been extremely helpful in curating, and it turns out every bin has a list of contents. So basically, as long as we know this is a harbor seal, we can figure out what bin it should go in. So I'm just gonna go do that. You can follow along, and then we'll drive it back. Well, you can tell that we're, um, always excited at the end of our shift. We seem to double time at uh, packing back up. I did want to mention that um, behind the scenes, I mentioned that uh, our bins uh, are all beautifully curated with labels and that's uh, Mickey McGuire, uh, kind of unsung hero of Mint actually uh, curates it and makes sure everything's up to date and puts nice labels on it and all that, which is a huge task that often goes uh, uh, not well noticed. Um, we're going to have questions and answers. I have a couple of other things quickly. Um, I'm really excited that uh, uh, because Monterey County went into the red tier, um, we, along with public walks and scoping, have been um, permitted now to restart these programs according to sort of a reopening guidelines, which we um, wrote up and submitted to Sean um, of State Park. So hopefully in the next week or two, uh, we'll be taking Mint out. Obviously, it's not the same thing. It's changing from a touch and tell to a show and tell. Uh, but at least we'll be out there. We'll be out at Bird Island. It'll be great to be out there during pup season. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And I'm sure other docents are as well. So with that, um, questions that I think Tracy said were there's not that many people so we can people can just unmute themselves and ask away. I have a question. This is Don. Uh, oh. Do mute or excuse me do mint drivers need to take any special training before they drive the mint van? Well, you have to be a docent for 15 plus years, and then you take a one year mint training class. Um, yeah, so the answer is basically yes, we have a kind of a one time training. Um, you know, we all know how to drive, but this electric vehicle is a little bit funky. And uh, so basically, what we do is we take uh, any docent who wants to be out on a training run, let them drive it. Um, let them set up, tear down, put it back, and then you just get put on a, a list. So yeah, there's a, there's a pretty minor requirement, but yeah. Okay, so just shadow a, a person who's already a mint driver then. Um, actually, the way we do it, Don, is you would just uh, basically talk to me and either I'll do it or Pat will do it or something like that. So we All right. can get, get it done once. So um, we have about 60 docents who are qualified. I'd say we have probably about a dozen 
that pretty much do a shift every month. Just mm -hmm. FYI. It's a lot of work. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's about a half hour out there and set up a two hour shift and kind of a half hour back. So it's a, it's a long, um, it's a relatively long shift for people. Other questions? Gee, gee, Chris, I'm surprised that you think it's half an hour to get back. I get back in about 12 minutes. Is that going too fast? <laughs> yeah. that, you can't, you know, it's funny because it's a cute little vehicle, but it basically drives like a tank. It doesn't have power steering. The thing bounces even on the slightest bumps um, in the road. It's really uh, kind of fun, but it's great. Um, yeah, there, there are no shots. I'm sorry, go there, ahead. Are no, there are no shock absorbers on that minivan, <laughs> as we right. know. Um, I will. I have to say, I am so excited that we're coming back because I think Mint is one of the absolute best things we do at the reserve. Not that I'm prejudiced, but, um, but people are so excited to be up close and personal, even if you're just telling stories and we have to stop the touch. It's the tell and the contact. It's amazing. So... Yay, ready to come back. I'm surprised no one's asked the question that basically we always get asked and we get asked either kind of nicely, where did you get these artifacts? But as often as not, we get, did you kill them? Yeah. And the first 50 times that I've been told that, I still freeze. And <laughs> If it looks like someone who's kind of fun and, you know, that, I go, well, not today. Um, but I try and be careful with that response. Um, but, but an interesting response here is that it's sort of ironic, but to my knowledge, and Pat might have other knowledge, none of these artifacts came from Point Lobos because we don't take things from Point Lobos. Right. And so, um, but it's also important that Things like harbor seals and sea lions all come through marine mammal rescue. So they make them available for educational purposes. So it doesn't really cost a lot of money. You just get on a list and you don't know when you're going to get one. Um, otters, as an endangered species, you're not actually allowed to have one in your possession. So we actually have a signed um, uh, numbered form that allows us to actually have an otter pelt, and that comes through uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium. Mm. Sort of just manages that in that program. Most of the rest of the things um, from all over, we've been given. Um, someone's estate gave us five boxes of abalone shells to state parks. <laughs> Unfortunately, they had shellacked them, so we had to spend a lot of time scrubbing it all off. Uh, we got a beautiful, uh, the Fern Ruth collection was, um, and I, Pat probably knows the history here, but basically it's a whole set of birds and plastic tubes and uh, formaldehyde uh, skeletons and things like that that we were given. And we now put some of those birds out. We just had them cleaned. Pat actually found some nicer things. But some of these are amazing. We have a hummingbird, I think a Anna's hummingbird from 1898. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was part of the Pacific World Museum collection, and Judd Perry was the one who got it for Point Lobos. And as you and I have talked, that that hummingbird is so incredible, and having the ability to see it just blows people away. So having them in the tubes, and those have always been no touch. They're just let's look, um, but they're very fragile. So yeah, fantastic. Yeah, and that was something that actually Pat worked on just before we closed down was getting some new tubes, as it turns out, are kind of interesting. They sort of compress the, keep the subject rigid, but you can turn it and see all aspects of it, which is really, uh, which is really great. And of course, the other thing you might have noticed the cormorant and the uh, black crown night hair had the uh, do not touch sign of shame hung over their neck. Some of that's because they are loved. But the other part is they're old. And so the techniques they used for taxidermy used all kinds of nasty chemicals. And so that's another reason you don't want. Now, what's fascinating about the pelican, and we have a pelican, uh, the gullet and the head as well, I didn't show, 
is we worked with a taxidermist who is uh, apprenticing with a guy who used to work at the Smithsonian and they have a new technique, which is effectively freeze drying. It turns out if you can take all the moisture out of something, it isn't going to attract any pests or rot. So they basically put it in a vacuum chamber and left the pelican in there for two or three weeks, measuring the weight basically. And once the weight doesn't change anymore, it doesn't have any more moisture and voila, you have a, a specimen. And so for things that like our peregrine falcon, I think we'll be able to get, they won't have to cut it, right? In the old days, they would cut through the bone, open it up, scoop out all the gooey parts, sprinkle all kinds of terrible chemicals in. And, you know, I think that's what they did anyway. Sprinkle chemicals in and sew it back up. And you can see our weasel, you can see the suture marks effectively down the belly, right? So this new technique, I think, is less, less bad chemicals and doesn't actually require any altering of the animal. So it's kind of exciting. Um, and the guy's in Watsonville. I got to go see his apparatus. It's really quite the Rube Goldberg uh, uh, apparatus that he has. Very cool, very cool. Any chance, Chris, of getting a uh, dusky-footed wood rat? Um, if you can catch one, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's really actually interesting because, and I should have thought of this, uh, uh, Karen and I were out doing our owl hunt, which we've been doing for the last month and seeing it about four or five times. And in the middle of the trail was a dead but not mangled dusky footed wood rat. I should have scooped it up, but I guess I'm not supposed to take anything from Point Lobos. I have to go across the street or something. Yeah. Smudge it out of my jacket. It'd make a great exhibit up next to the nest. Uh, it'd be beautiful. It would be. Yeah. It's a great program. I'm, I'm, I'm excited too, as Pat is, to see it coming back. It's, it's uh, it, you, you have so many opportunities to teach in a small space and with the COVID restrictions we have, it's just a great interpretive um, center of excellence. And I'm gonna borrow your gooby parts uh, for, for the next time I have. <laughs> no gooby parts, that's great. Yeah, I, uh, I, I too would echo what, uh, what Jim and, and Pat has said about being excited about uh, going out there. And I think one of the differences, and you've talked a lot about the birds, at neither of the uh, info or whalers do you have the same opportunity to talk about the birds and particularly to show that that wing and to talk about you know birds eye or owls eyes and how they have to turn their head they can't move their eyes and 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 the different kinds of bird tools they have that that are popular for uh, for doses uh, to to talk about and I think that's a, a major feature and difference that, that you guys have done a really good job of. Uh, of providing the docents. As I'm sure you understand Don's a mint driver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, there's a couple of things that have come in the chat. Um, uh, what are some other specimens that are on the mint wish list? I think that's always, um, we usually, you know, right now, uh, there's always some that are important. For example, we, we, we don't have a really good sea lion and harbor seal skull. I showed you the harbor seal skull, but actually some of the teeth are out of it. It doesn't have the lower jaw. And again, these things just over time, they just, people handle them, right? So I think, I mean, those are really important because everyone came in there hearing the sea lion and really being able to see it. We just got a beautiful sea lion pelt that replaced a very ratty one. We got a new uh, uh, black-tailed deer pelt that's just gorgeous. Um, that again makes a big difference. The old one kind of go like, well, that's not that nice. This one is just absolutely the most beautiful, smooth, supple fur you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, mostly things like that, I, you know, we have an opportunity. There's a freezer state parks has that, you know, it turns out rangers and other people find animals and they're nature lovers. And so sometimes they throw them in a freezer. Mm -hmm. And so we will have an opportunity uh, from that freezer to get some um, really exciting specimens as well. Chris, that's what I, that's what I was going to bring up and, and just do a special thank you to the PLF because it's thanks to them that we have been able to get into the state park freezer with their permission. Uh, 
and select some of the most fantastic animals. And they have so many. And I remember Chris and I going through and just salivating over some of those. Oh, maybe we can get this one this year. Um, because changing the collection out each time you go out or seasonally or depending on you know, what things you're trying to do, if you're trying to do a climate change talk, you know, you can work your animals around that. And there's just so much there. And state parks, I think, would love for us to clean out that freezer a little bit more. It's, it's pretty packed with good stuff. So thank you, PLF. You know, there's been uh, one of our dozens, Jack Arnold, has tried to do some pressing of the kelp. So for example, we don't really have a good way, you know, most of our invertebrates and tide pool animals, uh, of course, are, obviously they're dead, but a lot of them lose their form or like the sea urchins, uh, we sort of have one with some spines, but the spines fall out. But even things like the whole kelp beds, which are kind of critical, we don't really have a way of of showing and talking about them and their own beauty. Um, and that's something that um, we haven't really been successful yet. It's not as easy to press kelp as one might imagine. So we, um, that's one of those that we need to try to figure out. Jim. Chris, uh, Chris, do you, do you ever uh, display uh, uh, plants and, and have discussions around the uh, the plant community? It's a really good question. I would say the answer is basically there's no bin marked plants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's interesting now. So talking about the forest and, you know, cones and that, yeah, that would also be a really fun idea would be to get the Monterey Cypress cone and, uh, you know, the, right now the pines are putting out the male and female parts and you can walk along the trails and see those and Mm -hmm. uh, that could be an interesting uh, interpretive as well. Mm -hmm. I, th I think one of the, uh, one, one interesting thing, I, I think it started with Nelson when he put the great, uh, the black crown night herring up on top of the, the mint van. And it was interesting to watch all the people come and with their cameras and they were sneaking around the mint van getting ready to take pictures of this black crown night herd on the top. And I, I think I spoke to Nelson about that and he just sort of put it up there while he was uh, taking the bins out of the mint van. And I, I noticed that a lot of, uh, that a lot of people just leave it up there now. I thought, I thought it, was, it was a great attraction. Yeah, I've done that as well. I mean, there's pluses and minuses. It, uh, does sometimes get windy and I, I'm not sure yeah. it's, uh, yeah. it, it helps our birds, but I often put them up there mainly because we have so many artifacts and we don't want people to touch them. Right. And so, and they use up a lot of room. Um, I don't know if you saw in the cube uh, in the video uh, a couple of years ago, we got, uh, Pat got us this cube and that's a great horned owl. And he just, people are in awe of look, it is such a gorgeous specimen to be able yeah. to can to get six inches away from it and just look at it. Um, and again, you know, kind of a fun story I always do is, you know, what kind of, everyone knows it's an owl, what kind of owl? You know, most people, and I said, well, it's named after its little tufts of things and great horned owl. I said, you know, it'd be really scary if those were real horns, right? It's just the ears. Yeah. And most people go back and go like, oh my God, I ne never really thought about that. Of course, a great horned owl doesn't have horns, but it's, <laughs> It, it usually makes people. It usually makes people laugh. Um, Pat asked. I think that's Pat about what our COVID is. So, um, so obviously, any any reopening exercise has to talk about safety of docents and safety of visitors, and those are kind of somewhat different. Um, when we put together the program, there was no vaccine. Um, so I think that's going to change a little bit the safety of docents in terms of docents. Uh, two docents on a shift or docents touching the artifact. There was a lot of concern about, well, we can't have two separate docents, which we usually have two people at the mid band that aren't in the same household. And then we don't really want people touching because there's kind of this unknown, you know, like, well, how long is COVID going to last on a sperm relative? And the answer is, how would anybody know those kinds of things? So what our program was basically saying, one docent or docent uh, couple, 
uh, Jay and Pat. Um, and we'll just do one shift a day, which means that basically the artifacts won't have been touched for 24 hours. We pretty much only go out on the weekends um, if people want to take it out during the day. So that's sort of like the docent safety. From a visitor docent safety, basically we're putting a uh, plexiglass, just a low plexiglass around the table so that people can see the artifacts. You can actually peer over. It's not a sneeze guard. It's just sort of a, a barrier, sort of a symbolic barrier. And then we're going to put basically a stanchion and chain about three feet away from the table to keep people away. So you got people, chain, three feet, table, docent, and that'll keep the docent six feet away. So that's kind of our idea. Um, and then try, and then what we'll have to do is manage the groups of people and try and get them to say, look, you need to, you know, go up and see China Cove, come back down. We already have groups. So that's the part that we'll have to manage a little bit. Um, but that's basically our plan. I have the plexiglass. I'm waiting for the feet. Um, because you know, I thought about it, it gets windy out there. And last thing we want, probably the biggest safety concern would be a whole bunch of plexiglass blowing across the table onto the docent. So uh, <laughs> we want to make sure that's secure. Um, and then basically we'll be ready to go. Um, you know, I think some of this will change in the next month or two as more and more docents are double vaccinated. Uh, we might be able to allow docents to sh share a shift if they're comfortable doing that, uh, if everyone's if everyone's vaccinated. Um, but right now we're gonna do this. I think we'll get out there and slowly restart. It's gonna take a little while to get used to all this. We just use rubber gloves, you know? Well, rubber gloves don't, you know, you still have the issue of if, if I'm handling, you know, if you worry about spreading it onto surfaces. And yeah. some people to worry about it more than others. Um, rubber gloves don't really help. I mean, I'm picking it up and then you're picking it up and I'm picking it up. And then I'm not taking the gloves off every time I pick something up, right? So yes, I can take the gloves off and then sanitize my hands, but I can also sanitize my hands. So we decided it's just simpler. Let's start with something that everyone, uh, you know, this whole reopening world is as much about making people feel comfortable as it is about uh, you know, the science of COVID on sperm whale tooth, right? Yeah. So we decided to opt for something that would keep people comfortable. And even now we don't know, we haven't, I don't know how many docents of our drivers will feel comfortable with these restrictions. Just no idea, um, but you gotta start somewhere. Right. Chris, did you see, um... There was a question, and I, I'm interested to hear. Um, uh, where was it? It was really oh, interactions. Do you have favorite stories? Because I love to hear how people react to these. I know I've seen photos, and you watch this, the school children there, and you watch visitors, and how amazed they are. Because unless you formerly were at the pelt shed over at the info station you would never have an opportunity to see these artifacts. You would never get to see them. And that's the wonderful thing about the mobile interpretive part of it is that it brings that interpretation out into different parts of the reserve, reaching many more people. So I'm sure you've had a lot of fun experiences. Any you'd like to share? I can share one and maybe I'll ask Pat to share one as well. Yeah, the thing that I, and I mentioned this in the video is um, at Info, you're doing you know, we're obviously selling some things, but mostly you're wayfinding, telling people where bathrooms are, and then you get the pal chat. Usually the interpretation experiences, especially on a busy weekend, is really small. I mean, if you get a minute or two, you're sort of lucky. Uh, then you have public walks where you might have an hour or two, which is completely dedicated to an interpretation experience. And mint sort of fits nicely in there. I would say interactions are usually five minutes or less. Sometimes you get groupies who hang out for a long time. Uh, um, but that allows you to weave some stories. Well, one interaction which was really interesting for me was there was a, a, 
a, a car pulls up into the handicap, which is right next to where we set up at Bird Island and out come a bunch of people. And there was a very, very old woman being helped by presumably her daughter or a younger woman and was kind of guiding. And the older woman was walking towards the table and the younger one was kind of guiding underneath the elbow and they walked to the table. Um, and I started talking um, to the older woman and, and I said, oh, do you know you want to do this and this? And then I began to realize there was something I didn't, was not processing about the situation. And then it became really clear that they were helping each other because the daughter was blind. And so I had her come up and say, okay, well, um, you know, you're at a table, you know, and, and, and so don't step any farther closer, but why don't I hand you, and I handed her um, the sperm whale tooth. And she just sort of, you know, felt it as only I think maybe blind people can do uh, and was just sort of in, in awe of it. And then, you know, uh, uh, mother and daughter, or maybe grandmother and da uh, granddaughter for all I know, were kind of conversing a little bit. And then she told me that she was, um, this was really fun and that she was getting her uh, PhD down at UCLA and, you know, teaching or something like that. It was just absolutely mind boggling. Um, and I wish that I had picked up on it faster, but at least I did finally pick up. So that was really pretty exciting because again, you could touch and, you know, they didn't stay very long. I think she did maybe handle two different things, um, but still it was a, a way of actually being able to explore um, in a completely different way. I don't know, Pat, do you have a favorite story you'd like to share? I don't see Pat. Sorry about that. Um, so many, so very many. But I think one of my favorites was we were talking, had a group there and we were talking about humpback whales, which are my favorite whale. And people were very impressed with touching and feeling and listening. But what they weren't doing was turning around and looking at the bay and the whales were right out there. So I'm sitting there saying, okay, here's this and this and this. And you know, you guys, Here's what I suggest, turn around, look out there, and what do you see? And literally there were humpback whales breaching. It was a big feeding event. It was like, oh my gosh, this is so real. And that's the other thing, Chris, that we had, and I don't know if we're going to be able to use it or when we'll be able to use it. But one of the cool things is <clears throat> if you're working too at Mint, one of you can take our dedicated scope and go to the edge uh, right by the stairs at China Cove, if that's where you are, or at Bird Island. And then you do kind of a tandem. You can look through the scope, see the real thing, then come back and touch. And it makes all those connections and allows us to talk about the wonder of the reserve, the wonder of nature, the protection. It's just such a whole experience, you know? So I think that's probably one of my favorite times. There's some, I just, there's just too many. Every time is a good time. So. It, it is really fun. And again, I, I mentioned Pup Watch is another great, you know, we, we have a whole bunch of docents who are dedicated to be up in China Cove in particular to, uh, to watch overs and they answer lots of questions, but then you can come down and we actually have a, uh, a so-called Lanugo coat, which is the premature pup yeah. coat. And, you know, we do have a couple of preemies coming around and people get to experience that. I mean, you actually get to feel it. And also just this wonderment of the idea that harbor seals are born with their second coat. The first one molts off. And so you can talk about that when they just, either before they go up, which is hopefully, so that they're already behaving and, and, and understanding what they might see. But oftentimes on weekends, um, you know, we're getting 1,500, 2,000 walk-ins a day uh, through COVID. COVID has completely increased the number of visitors, um, in, in case you didn't know this. Um, and of course, a huge number of those people walk into the reserve, turn left on South Plateau. Everyone knows they want to be to China Cove because that's the one that's on social media with the beautiful picture. And they walk down South Plateau they hit China Cove, which is why it's so important to have doses, because that'll be the first time they've ran into anybody, 
right? And then they come down the stairs and we have a great opportunity to first of all, introduce them to the rest of the reserve. Uh, we do have a map now at Bird Island, but before you would come down the stairs to Bird Island, you didn't know where you were and there was no map, there was nothing. So we have a great opportunity there also to um, continue the work that the Pup Watch docents have done and, and actually be able to uh, show that, show a pelt uh, and things like that. So definitely fun. One of the keys that I, I hear in both Pat and Chris's comments is the um, opportunity for engagement. And the last year of being at the reserve, I've just noticed how our visitors are really um, so much, very independent. If you ask them if they would like to know anything about the reserve, pretty much they're ready to just go and they're there hiking, they're there moving along without much engagement. And to me, the gift of the Mint Band is that it really does provide that opportunity to really engage our visitors and tell our stories, um, help them understand our, our goal to protect and preserve uh, Point Lobos, as well as to hopefully have them leave the reserve being stewards of their own environment when they go home. Um, we have so many stories to tell, but a lot of the visitors were really not in, engaging with that during the COVID times, just for all the reasons um, that it brings along with it. But to me, um, and I thank um, PLF over and over for, and Pat for being tenacious about getting our mint van up and running um, and being such an important part of what we do as docents. Thank you, Betty, appreciate that. If there aren't any other questions, I'd like to thank everyone for being here and wind down for the day. I've enjoyed spending this morning with you. And Chris, thank you so much for your phenomenal presentation. Um, and Pat, thank you. For those who don't know Pat, Pat was the original coordinator. Um, and Chris has taken on after uh, Pat stepped down. And so we continue the tradition. And we're just so happy to share this program with you all. And if you any, if any questions come up as, as you go through the day and you reflect back, please send an email. I'm happy to get any questions answered. Um, and we'll, this is a recorded uh, video, so it'll end up on our YouTube channel. You can always go back and share it with your friends, your family, um, anyone you think might be interested in learning more about the MINT program. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Chris, do you have anything to add? I'm surprised that no one spotted the mistake in the video where I was going through the invertebrate bin and said, oh, and we have skulls. <laughs> That's because I would have put the skull, the skull the bin into the wrong bin. And I was just reading off my I want to make sure lady. Okay. Right. We all saw we all saw that. We were just being polite. <laughs> Well, we all have had misorganization at one point or another. So <laughs> thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, PLF supporters, for all you do to make these programs happen. Have a great day. Okay, thanks, Grayson. Thank you.